Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and the long-awaited part 4 of my Halo Infinite DLC series. This is the final part of this series and I do apologise that it's taken as long as it has. I had some new ideas pop into my mind that I wanted to kind of flesh out and see if they could hold water and if they could fit into the storyline so it took a little while to work that out and then when I did figure it out it took time to actually integrate it into the existing storyline narrative that I'd kind of established for what I wanted for the final DLC so I do apologise it's taken as long as it has but this is the long awaited part 4. Now if you're not aware of what I'm talking about basically there was the original intention with Halo Infinite to have campaign DLC and of course it was once said that Halo Infinite was supposed to be the next 10 years of Halo and I made a video a good long while ago basically saying that the Infinite campaign that we actually got well it's very abundantly clear that there was supposed to be more DLC because really almost the entirety of the Halo Infinite campaign took place in one single biome and basically played out like a very extended version of the second mission of Halo CE. And it was also said that Halo Infinite was supposed to be something of a soft reboot, with Halo CE being the source of a lot of inspiration. And I'm sure we can all agree when you walk around the open world of Halo Infinite, it does bear a striking resemblance to that of Halo CE. Again, I've linked the video down below on my comparisons between the two, for your information and I've also linked the other three parts of this series. Now the idea of this series was basically if the intention was that Halo Infinite was to be 10 years of Halo and it was inspired by Halo CE and the campaign we got seemed like just one of the levels of Halo CE drawn out into an entire campaign, maybe each of the following nine DLCs totaling 10 campaigns altogether, would be inspired by each respective level of Halo CE, as Halo CE has 10 levels. Now the previous three parts of this series covers each respective level of Halo CE in its own campaign DLC narrative, with this part being part 4, covering the final level of Halo CE being the more that would have released in 2030. I strongly recommend if you haven't already to go and watch those other three because it gives you good context for what is about to be spoken about here in the final level, which will have been Halo Infinite's campaign DLC number 10 inspired heavily after the more from Halo CE that I've given the working title Time Consumes All. This campaign would kick off immediately where it left off in the previous campaign, with the realisation dawning that the endless plan on deactivating the time lock that Zeta Halo is held within, which would force the species on the ring to experience a hundred thousand years of time in fast forward bringing the ring back up to the modern era, but that would ultimately completely unaffect the endless as they are cellularly immortal. The realisation of this by Aatrox forced him to effectively abandon his banished forces and seek out humanity to try to broker an alliance to prevent this from happening. In the previous level inspired by two betrayals, Aatrox realised he was being betrayed by the Endless and then is betrayed by his banished as they attempt to kill him as he flees. Aatrox finally found his way to human forces and managed to broker an alliance, and that is where we pick things up in Time Consumes All, where now humanity, Chief and Aatriox are preparing themselves for the final battle. The Endless have massed themselves to leave Zeta Halo via a docking bay within the bowels of Zeta Halo on board a foreigner ship but the time lock itself is already on countdown. Within a flight of pelicans and phantoms from the Swords of Sanghelios, Chief, Humanity, Atriox and the Arbiter and Swords of Sanghelios prepare themselves. The flight is inbound for the time lock control room. The dropships touch down and the forces disembark and quickly move into a structure. Chief deploys the weapon to unlock the door ahead of them and they move through into the actual playable part of the campaign. They quickly advance and make their way through the facility, moving deeper and deeper into Zeta Halo. 
fighting past both endless and banished forces, eventually coming across a room that has a translocation pad at the center. Chief, Atriox and the Arbiter move forward and access the translocation pad, but are translocated to separate locations. They remain in contact via their communication systems as they continue to fight through their respective areas, moving towards the Time Lock control room. At this point you follow Chief's journey as he continues to move through the facility, making his way ever closer to the Time Lock control room, fighting through different waves of both Banished and Endless, including coming across an arena-type area where Chief has to hold his position while the weapon runs a crack to unlock the next part of the facility. This becomes a multi-stage firefight arena where the Chief has to go up against Banished forces first, followed by a wave of flood that take over the corpses of the Banished that he'd just defeated, and are now operating significantly more coordinated than he's ever seen them operate before because they're being instructed by the Endless, with the final stages of the firefight going up against Endless, both quote-unquote normal and flood-mutated Endless. But this is different from the way that a flood would normally infect a host, this seems almost like it's symbiotic, like the Endless themselves are using the flood to make themselves more powerful, to mutate themselves to higher forms, again suggesting towards the idea that the Endless, the Flood and the Precursors may all be one and the same thing. Chief finally defeats the final wave in the firefight and the weapon manages to crack through the system. The doors begin to unlock and as Chief steps towards them we change our perspective now to the Arbiter where we now fight through his respective area. We find here as the Arbiter moves through the system that his actions actually directly played into the fact that Chief had to face the waves of flood that he did. The Arbiter fights through Banished and Endless and has to activate certain consoles to keep the flood away from him. Again, the Arbiter's armor doesn't save him from flood infestation anywhere near as effectively as the Chief's does, so he makes the choice to access certain security consoles and enable certain energy barriers to keep him separated from the Flood, but that funnels them directly to the Master Chief, whom we get to briefly see fighting from the Arbiter's perspective as he moves through a facility that overlooks the arena that Chief is within. Seeing Chief performing superhuman feats from this perspective is a sobering reality for the Arbiter as he realizes that he sent the Flood to him, but also massively reassuring at seeing just how effective the Chief is at fighting. This would be, I would imagine, a very surreal moment for us as the player. The Arbiter continues on until he finds a secured locked area. This one, however, needs manual overrides in order to access and open certain circuits. This is when the weapon appears on a plinth nearby and asks for his help, as she's trying to decode the system so that the Chief can move out of the arena and in to the time lock control room. The Arbiter obliges and, with her instruction, activates these respective circuits for her to advance through the system and get closer to unlocking the system for the Chief. All the while the Arbiter is attempting to do this, he is still being attacked by forces of Banished, Endless and the occasional Flood. Finally it is achieved however and a system unlocks allowing the Arbiter to advance through a corridor that would also take him to a separate entrance into the Time Lock control room, while also simultaneously granting Chief the access he needs to move on. The Arbiter moves towards the security door where again we cut away to Atriox where we now fight as him through his respective areas of the facility. Atriox's journey is much more eerie. He moves through sections of the facility where he does encounter some resistance, but this is much more of a storytelling aspect of this facility. Within this area, Atriox can access recursive code and archived data that actually projects a holographic representation of events that had once taken place in this location, and the events that play out show the Criterion rendering their judgement on the Endless. Moreover, we see the Grand Edict instructing offensive bias to perform experimental procedures on the Endless, until finally Atriox comes into a chamber where he finds the holographic representation of offensive bias, the same one that we've seen in a few locations across both Zeta Halo and in Epitaph Tower. This one, however, is different, because this one actually speaks to him. Offensive bias is aware of the fact that he is now allied with the Chief, 
Aatrox asks Offensive Bias why he deemed it necessary to perform such procedures against the Endless, because it created the very enemy that they are now fighting. Offensive Bias admits that he is effectively enacting the same sins that Mendicant Bias had done so eons before, except in this circumstance, Offensive Bias was created without the freedom of choice. It was simply his directive. We get the opportunity through these interactions with Atriox and Offensive Bias to relive and see Offensive Bias and Mendicant Bias in the manner in which they were when they battled against each other before the Halos were finally activated. We get to see what Mendicant Bias did to the ancient humans, the mutations and flood experimentations that he performed on Zeta Halo. We get to watch Mendicant Bias fall to Offensive Bias after the effects of the Halo swept across the galaxy. We get to see the respective parts of Mendicant Bias's personality core be distributed across numerous key ships and shipped to the Ark for study, with just one such ship falling off of the grid, so to speak, and becoming the centerpiece of High Charity. And we get to briefly see Epitaph Tower once more where deep below the sands, Mendicant Bias is entombed, as well as brief flashes of Mendicant Bias attempting to aid the Master Chief when he was on the Ark in 2552. We revert back to the conversations between Aatrox and Offensive Bias, and due to the actions of both the Chief and the Arbiter, the specimens that Offensive Bias was still experimenting on managed to break free and escape meaning that Offensive Bias can no longer fulfill his objective, knowing full well that he must take control once more of Zeta Halo to get the Endless back into containment. The holographic projection of Offensive Bias disappears, likely retreating back to his actual physical carapace. After this narrative exchange, Aatrox fights through a few more waves of his banished fighting against him, tears his way through the Flood, Along the way, coming across a translocator which he attaches to his forearm and uses to fight around the Endless. Finally, he makes his way to a security door that unlocks as he approaches and he moves through to the Time Lock control room. The perspective now shifts back to the Chief as he enters the Time Lock control room and sees the Arbiter and Aatrox enter from different locations. Within the room, the Endless are busy manipulating the Time Locks and expediting the countdown process. The Endless activate protection energy fields around themselves as more Flood, Endless and Banished rush into the room. Our three allies now fight back to back to fight through the hordes of enemies as they pour into the room, whilst damaging energy conduits that are feeding the energy barriers protecting the Endless that are controlling the time locks. Eventually the final enemy falls as does the energy barriers and our three allies execute, the Endless manipulating the time locks simultaneously. Chief gets the weapon deployed into the control console but realises very quickly that there's no way to stop this countdown unless they retrieve the Encephalon, the very same one that the Harbinger stole from the monitor of Zeta Halo many campaigns before, and that this Encephalon was with remaining Endless boarding the Forerunner ship in the docking bay in the bowels of Zeta Halo. Chief informs the local forces that they opt to make a play for the Forerunner ship to stop the Endless and retrieve the Encephalon to prevent the Time Lock from dropping and forcing them through 100,000 years of time, killing them all via entropy. At this point our allies retreat back outside where they get onto a pelican that takes them to where the rest of the allied forces have been amassing near a surface access way into the underbelly of the Halo. Chief disembarks and takes a look over the edge into the depths of Halo, as the weapon quickly coordinates the other allied forces and puts an objective up on Chief's HUD. Now we get something approximating a vehicle run, where Chief jumps into a wasp and then dives into the underbelly of Zeta Halo moving through the cavernous expanse, dodging past sentinels and enforcers and fighting off banished forces and endless forces as well as Flood commandeered banished attack craft. 
In the midst of this gameplay, a quick time cutscene, so to speak, comes into effect where a Chief's Wasp gets damaged and begins to overheat, threatening to explode. At this point, Chief opens the carapace and bells out with a full freefall through the underbelly of Zeta Halo, where he then grapples to a Sentinel, landing on the head of an Enforcer and then jumping to a Pelican that drops him off at an immense wall with a small gap between it that is too narrow for any vehicles to pass through. He jumps clear and runs through. We then commence a Halo 4 style rapid movement through Halo's underbelly, similar to the Ghost Run in Halo 4, but instead this is on foot and Chief's speed is heavily augmented by different energy fields of sympathetic resonant frequencies as well as temporal interference. He then makes his way down and through to what can be considered as the inner underbelly where another pelican that's accessed this area through different means drops off a warthog where we get something more approximating a conventional warthog run as Chief drives full speed towards the docking bay. Over the comm system as Chief is continuing to progress, we can hear Atriox speaking to members of the Banished, warning them about what is coming. And although some of the reciprocating voices are initially in contestation to what Atriox is saying, they eventually start to believe him and suddenly the tide begins to shift, with the banished forces that were to this point attacking Chief while he was continuing on his Warthog run, now suddenly being identified as friends on his IFF transponder. The fighting now taking place around him now seeming more balanced as banished forces turn on Endless and Flood. Chief discreetly acknowledges this, watching his distance counter tick down until they finally arrive at the threshold. After moving through a docking control facility, they make their way out into the docking bay itself where something akin to the Great Schism has broken out with banished forces fighting Endless and Flood near the foreigner ship still docked. At this moment, coordinated attacks from the banished forces overwhelm the Endless. They're simply not prepared for the sheer force coming at them. They fight back but the timer is still ticking. Every moment delayed fighting is a moment closer to death for all but the Endless and the Flood. The weapon IDs the signature of the Encephalon and the Endless holding it as it boards the foreigner ship. Chief, aided by banished forces, blows through the Endless and the Flood. We then get this surreal moment where as Chief continues to advance, every opponent that goes for Chief is intercepted by a member of the Banished, Humanity, or the Swords of St. Helios. Three Endless close on Chief. Aatrox just blasts past Chief and clears the way for Chief to continue to advance. Chief aids in gunning them down. Aatrox and Chief have a moment of acknowledgement. The ship above sparks to life. Aatrox tells Chief it's time to go and hands him his translocation device telling him to use it when he has the Ancephalon. Chief nods and turns to leave. Moving at peak speed, he gets closer to the ship and realises it's about to depart as he moves up the docking structure to the ship, fighting as he goes. Two flood-augmented endless, large, hulking masses block the path ahead, but the Arbiter appears, dropping down from a structure from above with dual energy swords and engages them both simultaneously with expert swordsmanship he dispatches the two Flood Augmented Endless and turns to give Chief a nod of approval. Chief returns the nod and continues his advance as the docking aperture door opens and an energy barrier glistens to hold in the atmosphere. Chief rounds the corner and sprints at his maximum speed, faster than any Spartan has ever run, and with a single powerful leap, he clears the gap between the docking structure and the ship threads the needle through the closing ship doors and skids to a halt inside. On board, Chief moves through a nearly abandoned ship on his way to the bridge. The bridge also seems empty. He approaches the console and goes to upload the weapon into the mainframe, but is ambushed by the Endless's leader. A boss battle breaks out between him and the Endless leader, and as Chief finally nears the point of overpowering them, the Endless strike him away as Flood forms, then move towards the Endless Leader and augment him directly in front of Chief's eyes. The mutation is rapid, 
the endless boss grows and becomes larger and more powerful. And then this engagement continues, with Chief now having to fight a larger, bigger and more dangerous foe. After a protracted battle, the endless leader manages to grab Chief by the throat and lift him clear of the deck. In a manner not unlike the Believe advertisement campaign or indeed his engagement with the Didact, with lessons learned from his first encounter with the Jural Hane aboard the unyielding Hierophant, Chief waits for his energy shield to begin to recharge. The resistance generating between the hand of the Endless Leader and his neck gradually growing. If he moves too soon, the Endless Leader will double down and kill him, but if he waits too long, he'll lose consciousness. He waits for the energy shield to charge just enough to give him just enough resistance and he slips free of the grasp, primes a plasma grenade, and shoves the plasma grenade with his full force deep into the body of the Endless Leader. He pulls his hand free and the wound begins to look like it's healing. That is of course until the flood infestation that now augments the Endless Leader realises it's about to die and desperately attempts to disengage the symbiotic relationship between the two, but isn't fast enough. The grenade detonates finally killing the Endless Leader. Chief crouches down and retrieves the Encephalon, and as he does, more Endless enter the bridge. Chief stands, and the Endless, seeing their leader dead on the ground, rush him. Chief stands firm and waits for them to close the distance before activating the Translocator. He disappears from the bridge and emerges in the Time Lock control room once again. He uses the Encephalon to access the system and stop the Time Lock from deactivating. He then activates his comms and announces his success. The Adjundant Monitor arrives and takes possession of the Encephalon as Chief's comm system erupts into celebration. The Monitor expresses his gratitude to the Chief for all but ending the endless threat before becoming distracted and speaking of something nearby, almost mumbling to himself. The chief turns his attention back to his comms as the sounds of celebration quickly turn into voices of panic. Chief realizes something is wrong. Knowing that it will take him too long to get back to the ship on foot, and knowing that activating his translocator will put him back on the bridge of the ship surrounded by enemies, he turns to the monitor and asks for his help, in teleporting him back to the docking bay. The Monitor is distracted, rambling about a security breach, but the Chief manages to get his attention and asks him to calm down. The Monitor confirms that he's speaking of a proximity alert, informing him that something draws near to Zeta Halo. The Monitor agrees to send him back to the docking bay. He refocuses and teleports himself and the Chief to the docking bay. He appears in the docking bay and it's shrouded in chaos. As the Forerunner ship's engines have come fully online, their engine cones emitting quantum energy fields that has already killed large groups of his allies. The ship's weapons are also now coming online and beginning to fire indiscriminately into the allied forces. Humans and Banished are scrambling for cover as energy beams fire down from the Forerunner ship, evaporating them where they stand. Chief finds some cover, where he is promptly joined by Atriox and the Arbiter. A noise draws their attention. The docking bay has been opened to space, the energy barrier still in place holding in the atmosphere, but the great foreigner ship above them creeping forward to make contact with the energy barrier and pressing against it. Beyond the barrier in space, a fleet of unidentified vessels draws closer to the docking bay. The monitor confirms that the ships are likely endless ships, their hulls laced with green scintillating energy conduits. The weapon confirms that the endless communications are speaking of the Ark and that they know there is a portal to it on humanity's homeworld. With the state humanity are already in, following the created war and now the abating conflict with the banished, humanity won't stand a chance against a fleet of endless vessels. Humanity are now in the very real possibility of becoming extinct. The ships beyond begin firing on the energy barrier with green beams of energy that fluctuate and almost pulse with distortive shockwaves through space. 
The barrier quickly turns from a cool blue to an amber, shifting to red. They all realize at once that if the barrier fails, they'll all be sucked out into space. But the Endless have to be stopped from going to Earth. Chief Aatrox and the Arbiter order their respective forces back to safety, and all allies begin rapidly retreating while still being fired upon. Chief stands and begins to run, helping Marines, Brutes, Elites, any allies to their feet and getting them running to safety, dodging the incoming fire as he goes. The barrier shifts from red to a near crimson and then begins to fail, the Halo systems desperately trying to keep the barrier in place. Chief anchors himself, activating his magnetic boots to secure himself to the deck as the atmosphere begins to vent through the failing energy barrier. Allies get swept off their feet and pulled towards the breaches now sporadically opening in the energy barrier. Chief crouches and holds himself against the force of rushing air as Atriox claws his way to Chief's side. Ahead of him, the Arbiter makes his way to safety. Chief glances to Atriox, then to the failing barrier behind him and to the airlock barriers ahead. Chief fires his grapple to the ground near the airlock, grabs Aatrox's hand and retracts them both towards safety. The barrier behind them falls and the atmosphere explosively vents. Chief feels his forward momentum halt altogether, his grapple no longer working against the force. In a split second, Chief makes the decision and throws Aatrox towards the barrier who is now losing consciousness. The force of the throw sends Aatrox gliding towards safety, passing through the airlock barrier and back to breathable atmosphere. But the force also dislodges his grapple and sends Chief gliding towards the void. Chief strikes the deck, desperately trying to grab a handhold, but fails. He tumbles, strikes the hull of the foreigner ship now moving out of the docking bay and glides through the void before smashing into the edge of the docking bay doors and only just stopping himself from falling out and into space. His shoulder dislocates under the force and he grunts through the pain but ignores it as the rush of air calms to an all-consuming silence of the vacuum of space. The foreigner ship containing the Endless glides out into space and joins the fleet of Endless ships Chief watches helplessly as the Endless Fleet move away from Zeta Halo. Space ripples and the vessels immediately slip away from the ring. Chief gazes out into space, dreading what is to come for humanity on Earth. He looks around him and sees the debris floating in the void within the docking bay, the bodies of humans and banished floating lifelessly in the void. Chief takes a moment to himself. He holds onto the wall, floating in zero-g, and hangs his head. For the first time, he doesn't know what to do. They've stopped the time lock, but without deactivating it safely, there's no way to leave the ring to warn humanity. Chief is concerned, almost emotional. The weapon attempts to reassure him, and through a broken, sorrowful voice, Chief replies, Earth has no idea what's about to hit them. If the Endless make it to the Ark, they'll activate the rings. And that will be the end. We have no way of getting off this ring to warn them. Not true, the Monitor replies as he glides through the void towards Chief. The teleportation grid of Zeta Halo is a closed-loop system, but the artifacts across its surface most certainly are not. The realization is clear. The weapon agrees they could use these translocation artifacts to get off of Zeta Halo, and with the Monitor's help, he informs them that the time lock can be bled off if the ring is transitioned back to its original location and a lengthy process is put into effect without sending the occupants to experience a hundred millennia of time in fast forward but that it will take time to get things ready to do so. Chief has no time to lose. He braces himself and launches himself through the void, back towards the airlocks. As he glides through Zero-G, he navigates past debris and the bodies of fallen allies. 
very much a mirror to the cutscene from Warship Gabraken, he carefully moves both human and alien bodies clear as he moves past them, showing them all mutual respect. He glides over the docking bay floor as the monitor reactivates the gravity generators in the area. Gravity takes hold and pulls him towards the deck. He impacts the deck and steps through the airlock barriers. Atriox walks to Chief and makes a physical gesture of their alliance by offering his arm. Chief reciprocates and grasps Atriox's forearm in return. Atriox gives him an appreciative nod as the Arbiter walks up to greet them both. Once again, the Arbiter says, we trade one enemy for another. The Arbiter's forces growl in anticipation for the coming fight behind him. Atriox nods and with a wide grin, simply says they stand no chance against us all. His banished battle cry in reply. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, Chief speaks. The UNSC forces reply, hoorah. The scene cuts to a pelican carrying Chief, Atrox and the Arbiter, piloted by Fernando and touching down opposite one of the stone rings on Zeta Halo in the original campaign area. The monitor materializes and confirms that he can activate them but only very briefly. He hovers nearby and projects a beam of green energy into the stone ring at different locations, decoding the stone artifact. Chief lifts his arm and opens his palm, and the weapon appears. The monitor will continue to work on getting the time lock down, and when it does, banished ships will be waiting to rescue everyone, while we go through the portal and warn Earth about the Endless. I hope this portal gets us close. Green light emanates from the cracks in the stone, and the portal sparks into life. Chief replies, We'll be fine. Atrox and the Arbiter give him a nod of confidence, and they step through. The camera cuts to black. Roll the credits. After the credits, we get a very, very brief cutscene. Chief, Atrox and Arbiter appear on the other side of the stone portal, and they find themselves in a dark, frozen, icy cavern. Chief activates his flashlight, and they navigate through the cavern as it snakes its way through the ice. They follow the sounds of air echoing and howling through the caverns as it begins to wind higher and higher. They emerge on the surface, and Chief looks into the sky at the stars, and an aurora rippling above them. Scanning local stars to ascertain our location, the weapon says. Chief's gaze moves across the sky to a moon hanging low near the horizon. No need, he replies. We're home. The camera pans to reveal Earth's moon, and as the camera draws rapidly away, it's revealed that the three of them have emerged in Antarctica. The camera continues to pull back. Earth gradually coming fully into view as the fleet of endless ships drop out of slip space in orbit above Earth's surface. Cut to black. And so sets the stage for Halo 7, which I also have a suggestion for as far as the campaign narrative is concerned, but that is most definitely for another time. Thanks for waiting so patiently for this, I know it's been a long time in coming, but I made some amendments and came up with some new ideas that I wanted to get fleshed out before presenting it. I hope you approve and let me know what you thought in the comments down below, and until next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider smashing the like button and leave a comment below on what you'd like me to cover next. Big shout out to my patrons Spartan10148, the Metarch of my installation, Falcon, Prophet Bear, Mikhail, Sophia, and Ashley, my dutiful monitors. Darian, Scarab, Spartan0137, Anthony, Ghost, Aaron, Chris, Jacob, Sean, Element0, Somatic, Jordan J3, Dan, Mr. Keys, Directal, Gunslinger, Jacob, Van Mill, Echo, Evermore, Officer Cat, and Personal Devil, my diligent submonitors, my fleet of Strato Sentinels, and my loyal enforcers.
and all the other patrons who have jumped aboard to support the channel, it means more to me than I can accurately put into words. Another shout out to my Tier 0 Transcendent YouTube members, Spartan137, Jacob, Schmitty, Talia, Fenrir and Born Stella and all the other YouTube members keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy. Shout out to John for, I don't fucking know. And if you want more of this kind of content, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you don't miss any future videos, and consider jumping aboard yourself as a patron or YouTube member to keep the channel alive and kicking. Thanks again for watching, take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain.